Behavioral economics shows us how weird our brains are and how that affects our decisions. So in this video, I'm not only going to tell you about behavioral economics, I'm going to demonstrate this weirdness by showing you how running a marathon is similar to buying a car. Let's think how we would model a marathon in economics. On the x-axis is time. As we go further to the right, it takes longer for us to complete this distance. So over here is the good part. Well, that, that's faster. Over here, you know, it's the slower part. For any time it takes you to run this race, you're going to get some sort of utility out of it. You're going to get some sort of joy, satisfaction, however you want to call it. And that's going to be the benefits of running that time minus the costs of running that time. Suppose this function of benefits minus cost looks a little bit like this. It's this hump shape where there is this maximum point, this optimal point for you to run. To show you that this is the optimum, let's say that you go a little bit faster than this time. Well, you're gonna finish that race faster and there's a benefit to that. But there are also costs. You are overexerting yourself. You're putting yourself at risk of injury. You're going to be sore all weekend. You're going to throw up. So instead, you'd rather shave a little and be at that optimum. Of course, if you run a little bit slower, you save on some of your costs, but also you lose a little bit of your benefit. You know that you could have run faster. You know that you left something on the table. So this would be a standard economic approach to modeling a run. But what does behavioral economics have to say about this? Behavioral economics is about incorporating insights from psychology into economics. It's taking things that we know about how we make decisions and putting it into this decision-making modeling. I wanna focus on two things that behavioral economics brings to the table. The first insight is how we perceive benefits. And in thinking about this insight, it brings me back 15 years. In high school, I ran track. It's my senior year and I have one goal going into the season. I'm running the 300 meter hurdles and I want to break 40 seconds. Now 40 seconds is not even an elite time and I am clearly not an elite runner, but I knew that breaking 40 seconds just put me up into a different category than if I had been running my normal times. That's strange, right? 300 meters is an arbitrary distance. 40 seconds is an arbitrary time. Yet that was my goal and I never hit it. I never passed 40 seconds. And I've always been a little bit disappointed in myself for failing to reach that. My experience in track tells me that the way that we model this decision in economics might not reflect the way people make this decision in real life. How could we change this model to match real life? So let's take this time axis and let's say that the optimal time for me is 42 seconds right here, but I have this goal, this reference point that I want to reach. It's 39 seconds. The way that reference point changes this graph is that my utility takes a big jump once I hit that time. Now our utility function doesn't look very nice and it kind of goes against a lot of the things that we do in economics but it might be more realistic. Now the great part about economics is trying to take these predictions to the data and say, what would we see if this was the case? Well, let's think about marathons. Marathons are a totally arbitrary distance, 26.2 miles or 42.195 kilometers. That is the most arbitrary distance we have in any event. It has to be. It's not even a round number in either system. Well, lots of people run marathons and they have lots of different abilities. And so we expect with all of the optimization that they're going through, we would get the final distribution of marathon times to look like a nice normal distribution. But like my high school track days, marathons are not just run your best. People usually have goals and they have reference points. In particular, there's the four hour marathon. If you can finish this race in under four hours, you've crossed a threshold. And a lot of people set that out as their goal. Well, if you have that reference point and your utility is higher, if you can cross that goal, what you're gonna get is a lot of people who are at an optimum above four hours, pushing themselves over so that way they can cross that threshold. Let me show you a distribution of race times. and I want you to try and pick out where the four hour mark is. It is pretty obvious that the four hour mark is right here. Look at that big grouping where people are getting away from four hours and one second and going up to three hours and 59 seconds. And let me just point out what makes this so 
bizarre. People are just shaving two seconds off of their time. Two seconds is nothing. Over 26.2 miles, that makes no difference. And if it's worth shaving two seconds off of your time, you should do that at any point in the distribution. Yet people see these bumps. They see these places where they care about beating that threshold and they make sure that they run just two seconds faster to beat it. And to be clear, it's not just the four hour mark. There are other places where people want to beat that threshold. They want to get past this certain round number to, that to them is this big accomplishment. I think these results are fun, but they don't really blow me out of the water. We know running has a lot of psychology behind it. We know that to break the four minute mile, it took one person Person, and then soon after we just had a flood of people running that fast. There's a lot of psychology there, but a lot of these people are just hobbyists. They're just doing something fun. What about when things are real, when people come in and need money? What about decisions that cost you tens of thousands of dollars? What happens then? This brings me to the second contribution of behavioral economics, not the second total or anything, just a second in this video. But before I say what it is, let me introduce it with this experiment. Imagine you are presented these two cars and this is the number that's on the odometer. Now, whether you care about miles or kilometers, I don't care, take it in the metric that you care most about. I want you to decide between these two cars, which one would you prefer to have? Okay, now that you've made your decision, write down the mileage for those two cars. Write down each digit, there are five digits here, write down each one of those from memory. How well could you recall all five digits? If you're like these students in a behavioral economics experiment, most could remember the first number, a few could remember the second number, and then it got really hard to remember the next three. That's because the second contribution of behavioral economics is that we are not very good at processing information. Usually in economic models, we assume that people take in all this information as they're making a decision and they combine it to figure out the optimum. So that's like with the running, right? The assumption that I was making is that you understood your limits, you understood the conditions, you understood if you ran two seconds faster what the risk to injury was. But from experiments, we know that people are are not very good at processing information. If you want to read a great introduction to behavioral economics and what's going to give you a good introduction to this discussion, go ahead and read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman describes our thinking as two systems. There's system one, which is fast, automatic, intuitive. It looks at things and makes decisions in a snap. Then there's system two, which is slow, deliberate, rational. When we're trying to parse detailed information, we focus on the bits of information that are most important. In a five digit number, that's the first digit. That's why most people are able to remember the first digit of this number and they tend to ignore the digits later on. But again, this is just a lab experiment. This is not something with high stakes. Well, let's take this to real data. Let's look at what happens when people actually buy cars. Generally speaking, the odometer reading is a good proxy for the quality of a car. The more miles, the more you're worried about the condition that car is in. And the nice thing is, is it's a very continuous measure of quality. We should be able to see the price of the car decline with mileage. And you know that if you've had to buy a car, you know that higher mileage cars take a hit in their price. What the system one system two thinking tells us is that people might focus a little bit too much on the first number of the odometer reading and not on the subsequent digits. Let's compare two pairs of cars. If value decreases with mileage, then a 72,000 mile car should be less valuable than a 71,000 mile car. That's not a big surprise. Similarly, a 70,000 mile car should be worth less than a 69,000 mile car. But if we focus too much on that first digit, what we should find is that there is a bigger drop from 69 to 70,000 miles than there is from 71 to 72,000 miles because that six to seven makes a big difference in how we process the mileage on these cars. Again, we can take this to the data and what do we find? Here are prices of cars sold in a market to experienced salesmen. As you would expect, the price declines with mileage. But do you think you can tell me exactly when the first digit of the odometer changes? 
Yeah, there are huge drops all along this right when the mileage switches the first digit and it is irrational. There is hardly any difference between the two sides of this line, except the first digit is different. Behavioral economics explains this phenomenon better than classic economics. It shows us that our brain is doing weird things when it comes in and makes decisions. And it also shows us why running a marathon is like buying a car. We focus a little bit too much on those first digits. We're trying to beat a threshold and get a little bit more utility than we normally would if we were taking it in a rational way. If you wanna learn more about behavioral economics, you can take a look at this playlist up here where we dive a little bit more into attention, endowment effects, all these different things. And also this is a video in a series on fields and economics. So if you're interested in learning more about economics, go ahead and check out these videos right here.